here we are with my buddy Matthew Schmer. He's going to introduce me to his boss, and he's gonna go talk to us about vintage watches. Let's do this. Let's do it, boys. Okay guys, so thank you for joining me. Um, this is gonna be our first interview where we talk about the watches. You guys are the experts in vintage pieces and you guys brought a couple of heavy hitters for me to see. We're gonna start by introducing yourselves. My name is Matthew Bain and I've been doing the vintage watch business since about 1988. My name is Morgan Cardat. I've been in this business since the summer of 2008. And what got you into um, the watches? So back then it was a whole different game than it is today obviously it was just uh it was more like a club a hobby it was like a lot more underground than it is today my father was actually a watch collector started in the 1970s with pocket watches very nice he went over the wrist watches and one day I come home from college and i paid some attention to it but i was on a christmas break or something and i saw the the vintage wrist watches on the table I'm like these are pretty cool and then i was going to school in washington dc Went back to DC and start going around like hunting for watches. Let's see. Daytona's. I can't peek into the box either. You guys have All to right, wait with so me. These are called the Paul Newman Daytona, oh, and they're very, um, they're very nice examples. Um, Is this a factory Jubilee bracelet? Yeah, that's the factory Jubilee bracelet. Um, and they would come back in the days with those you, bracelets. You, with, you had the choice. You know, most of them came on Oyster, but say you liked a Jubilee better. Back then, it was not a big deal. Go to the AD. Hey, I want a Jubilee band. This is a, the most um, probably one of the most important pump pusher date Paul Newman's. It's the um, reference sixty two sixty four. So and what year more or less that's is this? Probably like um, late sixties, like sixty nine. It's probably the last of the Paul Newman's that was made. Um, the last of the Paul Newman's. Yeah, like the last series. Um, so the watch. It was very, very rare because it was probably only about a about a one year run on that one when they made it. Um, what a beauty! And it's with the the white dials have become very popular on the Newmans because Paul Newman's Paul Newman. Did you hear about that? Yeah, seventeen point yeah. eight million yeah. dollars. Ridiculous. Yeah. They're very durable. You know, they're stainless steel. But do you know the story of the Paul Newman? Paul no. Newman? Paul Newman's daughter had her boyfriend over. They were building some kind of treehouse or something, and Paul Newman asked, hey, "What time is it?" Oh, I don't have a watch. And then later on in the day, he goes, "Here, take this." And it was Paul Newman's Paul Newman. He actually contacted the family, and the family got involved with the auction, and a, a big part of the proceeds went to charity. This is another variation of Paul Newman. It's called the Reference 6241. So this is 6264? 64, right. 6241. This was a little more reduced, like, you know, number wise. Um, the 41 came non Paul Newman, Paul Newman. This is a very desirable combination with like the plastic bezel, like the black bezel with the black dial. You know, then there's the 39 reference, which I have one here. Um, it's in gold, it's not a Paul Newman, but it's a really good Daytona. He's killing me here with um, these Daytonas, man. This, this, this is, is like. like <laughs> this is like considered like bling for vintage. You know what I mean? That's our, our interpretation of bling. You know, like a gold, black dial. Very sexy watch. I see this and yeah. I want to be like yeah. on the Malfi Coast just drinking some champagne. And This is called the 6239. So these references, basically a 39 means it's a metal bezel. A 41 will always come with a plastic bezel. And the 6264 always has a plastic bezel. So usually the end number of the Daytona, it denotes to the bezel. Acrylic. Acrylic. Right. Yeah, gotcha. We call it plastic, acrylic. What beautiful examples. Which yeah. would, would be the most valuable out of this? The white now? Yeah, well, the white because also I said they only made about, they only made that for a one year run. Um, so, and if you look at the difference, there's, here's some geeky stuff of vintage. I'll give you some geek stuff. So, this dial right here only has two colors white and black. 
You see that? Correct. This one has red. Right. So they call this the panda dial. And the panda dial only came on this and one other reference, Daytona, and they're very rare. So when I first started doing this, everybody wanted the three-color dial. They thought that was more sexy, more attractive, you know, another color, red. All of a sudden, like now in today's market, the panda is much more in demand and popular than, than the three-color. It's strange because... I wonder if that's what took off, because since you do more of the modern type, what took off on the new ceramic panda, because it has kind of this, so, to me, this... In my mind, when you say panda, this is the first thing that comes to mind. I think this is the original panda. Got you. Yeah, right. yeah when they call this new thing a panda, I'm like... That's There's an AP panda, panda yeah. the, white, the white gold rubber, yeah. Daytona's a panda, but yeah. to me, that's a panda. That's and an original panda. Other vintage watches, with like Hoyer made a panda dial, Breitling made, like, it's become like a term, like a Xerox machine. Hey. You know, so Panda is like a general term for these just black and white dials. This Newman is the next in line for value. Um, it, this, so this trade's probably for $100,000 more than this, than, than this Newman here. And that's the thing, like, I like people that really truly do love a Paul Newman. And if it goes up, that's great. If it stays the same, that's great. Like, I collect art personally also and I buy art and I put it on my wall I enjoy looking at it on the wall if it goes up that's just a bonus to me correct like, I don't want to get taken like go buy a piece of art for a hundred thousand dollars and then it's worth 20 like a Hublot what's that <laughs> I'm gonna show you two watches that's called the Rolex 8171 1955 and it's a triple date moon phase the Italians call it the padalone which means big fr frying pan because it's like <laughs> you know it's like a wide kind of big watch for the period. It's an automatic watch. It's not a perpetual, but you know, you have to set the calendar and the moon, you know, like every couple months. And then this is a really iconic watch. It's called the John claude Keeley, because John claude Keeley, the skier, wore this watch. Um, so it's a triple date calendar chronograph. They made them in steel, pink, yellow. They made variations of these watches. Both of them are just highly collectible watches. And this was like when collecting kind of started like in the 1970s and 80s. This is really, this is it. A complications yeah. Rolex, you don't see that. You don't see that at all. And this is like the, you know, these are like the founding fathers, pretty much the predecessors to the Daytona. So these are iconic, both Patek Philippe references. Um, that's called the 2526. There's some reason they all want this particular Patek Philippe in this particular model. It looks like nothing, it's a time only, but what's special about it was the first automatic movement made by Patek. That's number one. It says Cuervo y Sobrino on the dial, That's which is... On that particular one was retailed by the Cuban store. Cuervo I've Sobrino. been to the store. Right. I've been to the so store in Cuba, was, very cool. So it was made for them. And what's really special about it is the face. The face is made of um, porcelain. It's called a porcelain dial. and. That, that's a big attraction to the collectors, is the material of the dial. Kind of like today, like a stone dial Rolex. Highly, highly collectible. There's some of these, um, like a platinum, I brought up to like four or $500,000. And, it's and just these? A, yes, a yellow one today, for nice condition. That's like a $50,000 watch, believe it or not. That's crazy. I would offer somebody gold value for that watch if I saw it <laughs> coming to my store. That's horrible. Yeah, and here's a good feature, like the crown. It has a double P right there. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Let me get that yeah, on the camera yeah, that, here. It's called the double P crown. This has a beautiful dial. If you show the close up of the dial, it has like a two tone looking dial to it. This watch is in rose gold. Um, highly, highly collectible because it's a. Uh, it's called the Reference 533. So to find one well preserved like that, you know, that's a snapback and a chronograph. A lot of time the dials are very dirty and. You know, this is just a mint, mint, mint example of that watch. What right. year is this, more or less? About 1945. 1945. Yeah. So then I brought the granddaddy of paddocks. It's called the 2499. And um, this is probably one of the most collected, ex real expensive paddocks in the world. Um, first model came out was the 1518, and then this was the 2499. Then Today is the 5270. 5270. Right. So. It's the Paul Newman of Paddock Collective. Wait, this is what would be the new 5270? That would be a 5270. My favorite, favorite, favorite yeah. Patek in the store right now would be the 5270J, which would be this just in a larger, more modern 
case. They went smaller after this. I don't know why. They made it from about 1952 to about 1980, this particular watch. There's a first series, second, third, and fourth. This is the fourth one, and it has a sapphire crystal in the fourth series, so it's a little more modern. But the size is bigger, because then they went down to the 3970. I don't know why, they shrunk it by about two millimeters back at, from like 85, and then they came out with the 5970, and then the 5270. This watch today is probably worth about six hundred fifty thousand. This right here. Yeah. So this is exactly why I like the vintage game. Look at a modern size case. The crazy thing is, you still have that concave bezel. Yeah. The, they they stay true to their lines from back in the day. So. Wait, so this is a waterproof piece? It was considered at the time. Yeah, because right. Because you could wash your hands with it. You wouldn't have to worry in a rainstorm. Or the one before that, yeah. you would have had to be very. See, so oh. this because these buttons have a seal in there, so that's like where a lot of water would go in. So that's why they consider, you know, say water resistant. So you pulled up these two Submariners. This is my personal Submariner here. Oh, you got one. Oh, cool. Yeah. So this is this is the one I traded for my 1977-1680. Let me take my guess on this. Okay. This is a pre Sea Dweller. Is it a Comex? Is it a? Is it like well, the? Like, is it like a? Like, very good guess. It's like a Comex. It's a um, well five five one four normally was made for the dive company called Comex, like you said, but this was not made for Comex. This particular one is a special watch. There was a this Saudi Arabian guy who crossed the English Channel, did it eight hours and forty five minutes, and the Saudi prince gifted the special five five one four Submariner to him for doing that. There's an engraving on the back. August 1977, 1977, eight hours, 45 minutes. His name can't is Asiagi or something. You know, it's a hard name to pronounce. And all the records are there, and I got it with a certificate and everything. So it's, it's pretty cool. So this is like more, it's a beautiful Submariner, collectible as a Submariner, but then the story is something else. And as we were talking about earlier, just about social media and the story and the entertaining and all that, collectors like this type of story they love a story of yeah, course so it's a piece of history too you're not just buying a beautiful submariner so it has two collectabilities and a guy that knows nothing maybe about submariners might even buy this someone that just likes the history of the guy that crossed the english channel my grail yeah. piece would be definitely a comex this i would be very happy with this yeah. piece so uh, what is what is this ballpark something like that's probably worth about one hundred fifty thousand dollars. jesus yeah. look at this piece and there's um, other Submariners. I should have brought one. It's called the James Bond. That's the very I heard first of that. Submariner. And now some of them have brought five, six, seven hundred, a million dollars for some of the James Bonds. But these guys that are buying these watches, most of them are just like they're very sophisticated buyers. Are there some really rich guys? And where they get these big prices are at some of the auctions. So the auction house may have like a huge art client and they push their art client, hey, this is really collectible. And all of a sudden you get these two art guys that are buying paintings for a hundred million dollars and they buy a watch for two, three hundred thousand, half a million, it's nothing for them. The auction, the auction houses are pushing some of these wealthy art collectors into this as a collectible. And that's how some of the prices have gone up too. Now this is an earlier Submariner. This is from 19, probably 60, 61. That is one of the very first 5512s, the reference that you mentioned. Now, what's special about that, look at the difference in the color of the dial compared to this. Hold them close. Yes, this has more of a matte dial. This has like this yep. greenish gold. Yeah, so it's called a gilt dial, and it's kind of turned brown. And the name to that is called tropical. My understanding, tropical dials can be any shades of brown, correct? Yeah, right. But if you compare them, this is definitely brown. I mean, it's a brown dial. And so collectors start paying premiums for these tropical dials because especially when they turn out like that they're and fade evenly and right not, like yes because i've seen very ugly examples but right, this is right. a beautiful example right, on exactly. this exactly sometimes it's like darker there and lighter there so when it when it's all even and uniform like that there's a huge premium to that but there's so many variations of submariners that are collectible you got the james bond you got the Comexes. You have a military sub that was made. Mill sub yeah. with the welded yeah. bars, right. and correct? Had, and I've had probably one of the rarest Submariners in the world that's in a collection right now. Um, I would say it's probably worth about between a million and two million dollars a day. It's a James Bond that was um, found down in South America. And uh, just the variation of it, it has like red writing and, and this collector really wanted it and I didn't really want to sell it at the time but he, he offered me money that I couldn't refuse at the time I did sell it that's one I regret selling because what year was this I probably sold it about 
uh, about 12 years ago. So a big six-figure watch then, and now, and I'm telling you, it's in the millions today. But not, I, I don't care about the money aspect of it. It's just the fact of owning the rarest Submariner in the world. Well, of and course, I, the money yeah. the money is just, that's yeah. why I like the vintage game, because it's not only about the money. It's Yeah, I mean, I paid a record price, and you, I was probably a little nervous, you know, owning something at that level myself. And that's probably why the reason of the time. I didn't steal the watch, you know, like buying it for nothing, like a regular one. I had to pay. Top dollar for yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I was, you know, 12 years ago was a lot of money. I think the internet and social media has taught a lot of new collectors about, you know, what's cool and created a lot of hype, which I think With is the how hype. we ended up where we are now. Correct. So. so the hype obviously increased and now the prices are dropping. Do you see the increase, I'm sorry, the decrease in prices happening as well with vintage or not so much? Not so much. But I think what a lot of people forget is the last couple summers, people weren't traveling. Summers are typically slow. And I think a lot of Correct. people are panicking right now and they shouldn't be. I, I do feel that we are headed in a down and decline. Sure. And, but if you look at the market where it was January to February, it skyrocketed like absurdly quick. So it only made sense that it evil leveled out. Right. Do you see prices getting back to retail, under retail, $1,000 off on regular pieces? Yes, I do. You see it getting I like that? I think on Datejust 41's normal colors, I think on Oyster Perpetuals, two-tone sport models, I think you'll start seeing them in cases again. He just keeps pulling out bangers. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> and this is really rare because it's from the 70s. It's with a plastic crystal, not sapphire. It's a 1600, 1601. Probably like a $55,000 watch today. I think like a lot of dealers today, especially in uh, the younger guys, which it's very expensive. I've been doing this a long time and I've built up capital and equity and I can afford to do this. But say a young kid getting into this business today, it's very difficult because it's very expensive. I mean, I used to like buy these, I told you these watches for 1200, a Paul Newman for 1500, you know? So a lot of these the newer dealers in the market today, they have to take a lot of things on consignment, our, our money, and it's much more difficult to get into the game today than it was when I got into it. Um, and it's understandable. I mean, it's really, really expensive. So, so I've had the capital and ability to stock things. So and sit on them over, yeah, over the years? I mean, I'll sit over them for two, three years. So I buy a watch as an investment myself. I'll say, hey, I'm going to hold it for two years and then decide to sell it. I don't, I don't sell things right away. Sometimes I just buy something, it goes in my safe for three, four, five years. No one even sees it, then I bring it out. I mean, there's some young dealers out there that have gotten into this, and I'm happy about that because it keeps... Keeps I it was, alive. Like, when I got into it, I was the young guy, you know? And, you know, now Morgan, he's getting into it. He's been into it for 12 years. and. And there's younger guys than Morgan doing it now. So, like, you know, it's um, it's nice to see because it keeps the industry going. And things have changed, you know, like the type of watches. Certain clients buy this collectible stuff. Other people buy the modern. All right, so if you could show me now your most unique watch mm -hmm. right, so, collection. You know, maybe not the most valuable in here, but very, very unique watch. Probably one a piece unique made by Audemars Piguet um, in the 1930s. And it's a jump hour, which was a really rare function at the time. What's unique is the case design. It's made of three different colors of gold, yellow, green, and white gold. Three different case metals. And you don't see that green gold anymore? No, you don't see the green gold. And um, I have the original drawing from AP on it. Um, a friend of mine that's a really big collector, he goes by Goldberger on Instagram. Has a lot of connections ap got me like the drawing of the watch he found the, the original drawing from ap on the watch like the sketch the prototype yeah, the sketch, yeah. oh yeah. that's so yeah. cool so i have that that's so cool and this is a manual wound watch as well manual one yeah 1930s and, 1930s uh, ap yeah and those are called these are called lugs and those are called movable lugs see how they move so it would curve to your wrist would this be considered a men's watch at the it time? It was a men's watch at the time, believe it or not. Look how small it is. It's actually kind of long, the length of it. It's just narrow. <laughs> and Morgan deals with a lot of modern Royal Oaks, but today we brought two... Interesting Royal Oaks. Yeah, collectible ones. This is a reference 5402, which is the original Royal Oak. Jumbo? Into Jumbo. This is a B series. So A would be the first that came out in 1972. This would be more from the late 70s. It's an amazing condition, um, and you could see a lot of it stayed the same. It has the caliber 2121 movement, which was the same in the 15202, and the model in between. And they changed it, I think, for the 16202. 
to have a longer power reserve and a quick set date. So that's the same movement as a 15202? That's correct. That's crazy. It's a modern one. Yeah. What year is this from, more or less? I'd have to guess like 78, late 70s. It's a, called a B series. Would you say this watch has been detailed? That one <laughs> I don't think so. Look at this. Also, if you want one nerdy technical aspect. See on the little flap, the flip lock? Mm -hmm. See how Audemars written out long? Okay. That's called the long form clasp. Later, they just switched to AP on there. Oh, so collectors okay. like that as well. Even the new ultra thins aren't this thin. It's true, because of the glass back. And here's another one that's kind of... That's tantalum. So right. this is tantalum. Okay, right. yeah, I noticed that gray color. Which is what I've kind of loved about AP. They've always experimented with different materials. Now it's ceramic. Before that, it was forged carbon. And they did a lot in tantalum, which I think is... It's a great metal. It, I wish it, they did one today. We spoke about it before. Like we wish like they made like a jumbo and tantalum. Straight tantalum, though. Right. I mean, the Jorn Chronometric Blue is tantalum. But it's just a great material. It has a little bit more heft than titanium. So this is a reference 14790, which is kind of like a mid-size Royal Oak. And they did a lot of cool things with the reference 14790. Different materials, crazy colored dials, or red ones. And it looks like it takes a beating. Like, it's oh, yeah. a very strong, yeah. heavy material. Very nice piece. So, you know, so we wanted to bring those because I know you deal in Audemars and... Speaking of Audemars, we have one more special watch. Well, I just, we did the Audemars. Oh. With an Audemars movement. Yeah, so this is Wait. a Cartier, but AP made the movement. This is called the Maxi Oval. It's from uh, 19, probably 1975 to 19, like from 70 to 75 they produced it. Very rare though, because of the size of the watch. People don't like larger watches back then. Audemars collectors and Cartier collectors both like it, you know, because of, you know, the combination of the two, of the two manufacturers. This is when Richard Mill thinks that they were making the first curved case. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. And it's kind of <laughs> like um, from that crash, Cartier crash period. It's at, at the Benoit, this Maxi Oval, and the crash were kind of like, you know, the same genre of design. It's just such an outcast, interior. like, oddball piece. Yeah, no, it's kind of yeah. I love it. I'd love to wear it with like. They put it on your wrist. Yeah. I like it. This. I like it. I like it. Yeah, yeah, it takes up my full wrist, and I have a pretty large wrist. Yeah. So for a vintage watch, so they made this for the London market also. So Cartier had houses in London, Paris, New York, and the London version is worth probably double of this, and it says London on the dial. So I'm telling you, this is probably today about a hundred fifty thousand dollar watch. Jesus. This watch, a Cartier, and we deal in a lot of vintage Cartier. I could bring a whole session of Cartier watches here. We could talk three hours about Cartier. I love vintage Cartier, and um, it's another type of collector that collects Cartier. The, you know, I've learned something over the years. When there is for specific watches or unique watches, say there's one guy buying them around the world, the market's really nothing. You know, it's just a normal market. All of a sudden you get like 10, 15 people after like the same type of thing, like the Cartier crash. Everybody's fighting for it. So the Cartier crash, 1967, it was developed and they made the London Cartier crash up to about 1989, 1990. And then in 1993, they came out with the Paris edition. But the London edition, I bought one at Christie's auction house about two and a half years ago for about 200,000. And I paid a world record for the... Everybody thought it was nuts. Yeah, they go, Matt, you're nuts for buying this. You're crazy. I really believed in it because I, I think there's only 10 Cartier crashes, 10 to 20 Cartier crashes that exist for the London market. That's it. In the world. This was one made in 1989. He had the one that was made in 1967, which is worth a lot more. So I paid 200 I did really well on the watch. Probably made about 20% on the watch. I was really happy, but it took me about a year to sell it. Not bad. Not yeah. bad. Yeah, but maybe a year I heard you winding. That's that's because the gears are crispy on it, like yeah, new, fine. right? And today, just a year later after I sold it, the watch just brought about seven, eight hundred thousand dollars. Oh so, man, you know. these markets are crazy. So that's my Cartier story. I love old Cartier, but that's a whole other subject, so I didn't want to bring many of them because they're all Cartiers are very individual watches and unique in design, a lot of the vintage ones. And so there's something to be said about each, each one. Right. There's some specific models. Like they probably made of this watch, I would say 100 pieces. 
it's not a lot, but you know, the, it popped up. Where the crash, you barely ever see it. So this is part of my lifestyle too, having this warehouse with all the collectible furniture and I like old things, so it goes with like what I'm doing also. I love it, so, that's so cool. And that's our little little show and tell that I... Brother, I appreciate uh, your time. Thank, thank you guys. Thank you. Oh, yeah. There's only one more thing I want to see, which, do you know what it is? When the first thing I walked into here, the vintage Porsche on there. Okay, yeah, we'll go down. That's there. the only thing else, and that's it. Porsche is from 1977. Such a badass car. Oh my god, bro. So my dream is to have my Tesla and a Porsche like this. Little old Porsche.